the thesis, and maybe you've heard this before, because I certainly did as an evangelical, is that there was this pristine, uncorrupted early church that at some point, often people point to Constantine as the, as the point when this happened, it became corrupted. It became Romanized. It became politicized. It became something different than it used to be in, in, its, in its teachings. Now, surely the church has changed over time, and certainly there are politics in the church, and certainly there's corruption in the church. This much is true. But was the early church, was, were the earliest Christians who were taught by the apostles, did they believe something radically different than what, what the Catholic church taught? Were they more like Protestants? Or, or were they actually sounding and, and believing and teaching and preaching things that were really Catholic? Was there a corruption that took place in the church? This week, I'm joined by Catholic Answers Apologist Joe Heschmeyer to dig into that question. We're going to look at what the earliest Christians, those who learned from the apostles, what they believed and what they taught, and try and, and figure out, well, were those things distinctly Catholic? Or were they more Protestant? And the Catholic Church came along and corrupted those things. This is such an important question to ask and to have answered, because if we want to live the authentic Christian life, we want to live in a way that looks like the way the church did closest to Christ, closest to the apostles. Was that a church that looked Catholic? Or was the Catholic church a corrupting force that came along later? This is a fantastic episode. I think you're going to love it. We dig in very deeply here, and Joe is just the guy to do that. Please enjoy. Hey, friends. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcasts, thank you. Please leave a rating and review if you can on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. And find us on YouTube if you want to watch what you're hearing on youtube.com slash The Cordial Catholic. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you. Welcome. And we're also on podcasts everywhere. Fine podcasts are found. And even not great podcasts, we're, we're on there as well. So do check us out, please. The Cordial Catholic. This week, I am joined by Catholic Answers apologist Joe Heschmeyer. He is the author of some fantastic books, including Pope Peter, Defending the Church's Most Distinctive Doctrine During a Time of Crisis, and uh, just out from Catholic Answers Press, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church, The Catholic Witness of the Fathers in Christianity's First Two Centuries. He's also a regular guest on Catholic Answers Live and all kinds of other things, but uh Joe, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. And Thanks hello. for having me back. I appreciate it. <laughs> I realized halfway through your introduction there that you do all kinds of things. You're regularly blogging still, and you're, you're appearing in different places. Uh, it, you're, you're, you're a phenom, I think, Joe, is a good way of putting it. Um, in, in a good way? Is that a bad thing? I don't, I don't no, know. that's, that's uh, very flattering. Uh, you're I a force of nature. <laughs> your, your, your books are fantastic. I mean, you're, we had you back uh, on this show a while ago talking about the Pope, Pope Peter, and the book you've written on the Pope. And I do think still that that that, that is uh, one of the most fantastic books to defend the papacy. I highly recommend that to anybody that I see who asks those kinds of questions. So that's a fantastic episode if you want to dig deeper in the archives to find Joe on there. We had you also uh, on a crossover with Austin Suggs from Gospel Simplicity and, and uh, Dr. Gavin Ortland talking about mm -hmm. uh, kind of this topic, actually, kind of the, the, the early church and, and does that, uh, was the early church Catholic? So I, 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 I'm, I'm going to guess, because this is what happens with this show, you came on the show, I asked you some amazing questions, really got your brain thinking, and, and a book was produced based on on my insights in, into... I, I'm sure you're half kidding, but there, there's, a, there's a shred of truth <laughs> to that, in that um, certainly in the chapter on baptism, yeah. there's a point in the conversation with Gavin where I, I mentioned the, the church fathers just aren't Baptists. Like, they don't believe in baptismal regeneration. And, and he is one of the best... Protestants on patristic stuff. And, and yeah. I, I don't remember his exact response, but it, I didn't get the impression that he actually disagreed. Yeah. That yeah. he wasn't saying, oh, look at all these fathers who, who are totally Baptist on uh, you know, the issue of baptism. That there was just nobody who, who came out there. Now, I, I don't want to... It was one of those things where there's a back and forth. Maybe he has a, a brilliant response, but certainly in terms of writing the book, it was like, well, right. If... If someone that well read on the church fathers approaching it from a very different perspective than I am, doesn't have someone who they can even like claim maybe is on their team on this, that's a really good confirmation that I'm not 
you know, just missing some really good counter argument that I've, I've overlooked. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. That was a great conversation. Also, uh, you can find that in the archives for the show too. Uh, so the topic that I want to kind of hone in on this week is I think a really good one that you kind of open, open your book talking about. And it's this idea that, that, Okay, so the early church was this pristine kind of uh, really uh, Christian thing that, that Jesus founded. It was great in the beginning and somehow it got corrupted by, by someone like Constantine or, or Rome. It got Romanized, right? And this is a, a really pervasive, even today, a really live issue to, to tackle. I'm thinking of my own background. I was, I, I was evangelical from the age of 15 onward uh, in, a, in a Pentecostal kind of church, charismatic. And it wasn't overtly anti-Catholic like some of these are. And, and I know listeners to this show might be in some more of those anti-Catholic camps and are emerging from those places. I didn't experience that. But what I experienced was the air we breathed was, in a sense, pervaded with this myth. The idea that, okay, so the early church was this thing that was great and the Catholic church corrupted that. And we're not Catholics because we're trying to get back to that early. Even though it wasn't, it wasn't overtly said every Sunday, but it was in the air that we breathed. And this is kind of ironic given this conversation we're having here and what happened a week or so ago, Joe, but I regularly open this show by talking about this experience with this pastor I worked for and how he kind of got me on this journey and this, this podcast is an outgrowth of that journey looking into the ancient faith and I became Catholic based on this journey. And, and this, this, this guy, this singular guy, this pastor that I worked for at this non-denominational church, Joe, I think apart from my wife and marrying her, I think he had the biggest impact on my life because he really launched me on this journey towards becoming Catholic, which really has changed my life in a drastic way, right? And he he asked this question. He was he was a non-denominational pastor of the student church I was working for, and he was doing his master's in early church studies and was raised Catholic, wrestling with these questions about the early church and, and patristics and how to understand it. And he was I was a sounding board. So he asked me would ask me questions about what I thought about this and this and the Bible and, and, and tradition and, and how the church did things. And that launched me on on this journey. But recently we keep in touch still occasionally. He's now gone on to do a PhD in historical theology. He he pastors a non denominational church that meets in a warehouse in Montreal in, in Quebec up here in Canada. And he remains, remains obviously uh, evangelical, non-denominational Christian, never became Catholic. Well, I became Catholic. Mm -hmm. But he recently posted this thing on Facebook, this quote from Augustine, talking about how important it is to interpret Scripture properly and really wrestle with it. And I, I being a guy who loves to look at the sources, I, I put, put the quote into Google and found the source where that quote came from. So I thought, this sounds a bit, a bit fishy. This, this quote in context, a good sentiment to you know, dig into scripture yeah. and to read it properly. But when I opened the full quote, a couple paragraphs or a couple sentences later in the same paragraph, Augustine tells us how we read scripture properly. And it's in relationship with the Catholic church. It's quite clearly right there in print, you know, interpret scripture properly. Here's how you do it with the Catholic church in historic continuity. And so I sent that off to him just kind of glibly on, on Facebook messenger and said, Hey, like, you know, uh, this, this is what else he says, about reading scripture. And his response was kind of along the lines of, yeah, that's great. And there's, there's good things that, that Augustine said, you gotta be careful about what, what stuff he says that's been Romanized, that's been corrupted from his original kind of meaning. And I thought, how interesting that was that yeah. here's a here's a guy ironically the guy that got me on the journey to become catholic but here's the guy who can look at augustine and find value in him and find value in the early church fathers he often quotes them in different places but then we we suddenly hit against this wall of okay that's good but then it got romanized then it got corrupted by something and whatever that original early church was it wasn't catholic the catholic church is is a corruption of that early church. So and it, it's remarkable because I've heard not a, that exact thing, but I've, I've heard very similar things, even going back to St. Ignatius of Antioch. Yeah. Oh, well, when he says Catholic church, he means something else by it. And, and so it is not even enough, apparently, for the church fathers to announce that they're Catholic. Yeah. Even that doesn't prove they're Catholic. They have to, you know, uh, announce that they're Catholic and look and sound like they're from the 19th century. And anyone else, you know, before or after that, well, that's not really Catholic because that doesn't fit the caricature of what we imagine a Catholic looks and sounds like. Uh, and it, it's quite uh, similar in some ways to a remarkably bad article I saw 
on uh, Medium, which is you know a, a great place for really bad articles to flourish. <laughs> and it was claiming the Lord of the Rings was not a Christian book. And the argument was, it's not super preachy. It doesn't beat you over the head. And it basically isn't like the movie Fireproof. And so since it's not that, therefore it must not be a Christian <laughs> book. And what it really <laughs> proved is like, this guy had a very weird understanding of what Christianity was. He may have yeah. had his own, if I'm guessing, he's coming from more of a fundamentalist Protestant background uh, based on the descriptions he gives of Christianity. And because it doesn't fit into that caricature, he's like, ah, therefore Tolkien wasn't Christian and his book wasn't Christian, even though Tolkien is passionately Christian, passionately Catholic, and acknowledges that he's bringing that to like the telling of the story that that he calls it a Catholic book unintentionally at first and then intentionally in the kind of editing process. Uh, so it's not enough to say he is. They're still going to say, well, you don't fit my caricature of what I imagine that to be like. Well, it's the same thing here. The church fathers, you got Augustine saying, yeah, I'm Catholic. And you got to follow the Catholic church and interpret scripture. I would not believe the gospel, but for the Catholic church, he says that and it's like, yeah, 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 but he meant, vaguely Christians dispersed everywhere. So he didn't. He very clearly didn't. He's distinguishing the Catholic Church from these non-Catholic Christians that he still thinks of as Christians, even though he thinks that they're outside of the full union with the church, that people like the Donatists. And so <laughs> it, it really is quite this remarkable thing, the kind of cognitive barriers, you know, where like, like that evidence couldn't possibly be Roman Catholic because it's too soon for the timeline. You know, it, we don't expect it that early, so therefore it must not be real. Uh, I mentioned Ignatius of Antioch earlier. John Calvin argued that his writings were forgeries. Like they seem too Catholic to fit into the Protestant timeline. And they are too Catholic for the Protestant. Like, yeah. he, he was right about that. <laughs> but we, we now know, and uh, Jaroslav Pelikan has, has some good research or good history of like, the research surrounding the authentication of Ignatius's works. And it was mostly Protestant scholars who actually vindicated the authenticity of these seven Ignatian letters. Uh, so, it, but it is that real, that thing where like even very smart Protestants who know the church fathers will often approach them with the presupposition they couldn't possibly be Catholic. And then that kind of prevents certain interpretations from, from being open, I would argue. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. I think that's what that's what's happening in large measure. I, it's so interesting and fascinating to to, to reflect on. I I think so. I wanna I wanna begin with this, setting up this premise here. The the premise that cause you do a great job of this in the book as as you open it. The premise that that Constantine or somebody around that time. Uh, my friend Rod Bennett always says, "Why Constantine? Like why is everyone telling you this hack Constantine? Poor guy." But you know, somebody around that time came and corrupted this this early church. So how can we begin to to address that issue, like what kind of what kind of things we have to tackle when we're going to ad address that? Yeah, I think we should do a few things. In the book, I I say I want to go to the preteen church, and that's a, a really lame pun for like pre Constantine and, and pre Augustine, uh, Augustine, if you want to pronounce it the Protestant way. That in these contexts, uh, I would say number one find the place of agreement. So if, if the person you're speaking to says, well, the church was corrupted by Constantine in the early 300s, then say, okay, so do you do you take seriously Christianity in the first 300 years? So if I can show you Christians in the first 300 years believed what we believe as Catholics, is that enough? Or are you just going to say, no matter how early a belief is, I'll reject it if it's Catholic? Because if, if that's it, then you're not really doing history at all. Uh, but then the second thing is to really try to hammer out uh, the argument, meaning this. I say in the very beginning of the book that if you're going to object to Catholic doctrine, you're going to be making one of two claims. One claim is Catholics are wrong because they followed the teachings of Jesus and Jesus was wrong. That's not what Protestants are arguing. I mean, occasionally the liberal fringes of Protestantism, you might find something like that. But for the most part, the people we're talking about say Jesus's original teachings were great. They're they're my beliefs, you know, whatever my beliefs are, whether you're Dan Brown saying he believes what Dan Brown believes or whether you're a Protestant saying, that, you know, he's a Protestant or a Mormon saying he's a Mormon, whatever. Uh, that there's some idea that Jesus at point A is teaching the things that agree with your theology at some point B, maybe it's Constantine, maybe it's whoever, this gets corrupted. And that leads to the Catholic Church. 
the thing that's beautiful about that is that's a historical claim. We can investigate that. And we can just keep saying, okay, wherever you put B, if you put it at like 313, if you put it at 325 with the Council of Nicaea, if you put it, you know, if you put it with the, the establishment of Christianity as the legal religion of the empire, and I think that what is that, the 380s, uh, whatever point you put on that, if we can go back before that and say, look, these, these teachings you claim were introduced then weren't because we find them before point B. That's a really good, I think, refutation of that. If I say, you know, the first iPhone came out in 2020 and you say, look, here's some documentation of somebody with it before that. OK, well, my theory is just falling apart. And at a certain point, I think a person who loves the truth, Protestant, Mormon, Muslim, secularist, whoever, to be proven wrong that many times about your historical claims should cause some deep soul searching about like, why am I getting this much history this wrong this frequently? And like, maybe the people who taught me church history didn't teach it to me accurately. Maybe they were malicious, maybe they're ignorant, whatever it was, but like, maybe my whole vision of church history is wrong because this Catholic or these Catholics keep disproving my, my claims about the first 300 years. Yeah. So you, cause you have to, you make that claim, you have to, and this is the interesting thing for me, right? It was this neb, it was a nebulous claim in a sentence. We'd say the early church, or I would think, okay, the early church was like this. And at some point it became corrupted. And but once you begin thinking with that, right? What you're saying is you have to pick a time and place, not yeah. a place, but you have to pick a time in, 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 in history. When no, 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 I'm, actually, case, I want right? to agree yeah, with you that yeah, place yeah. is important too. Like you can't just say, well, in 400, something happened. Yeah. Like well, give that, an actual yeah. theory, like True. who, when, how, like what's the evidence of it? You know, like if Constantine wrote the Bible or chose which books belong in scripture, Literally, where's the evidence? You know, and when Dan Brown in Da Vinci Code says Constantine chooses which books are in the New Testament, well, let's pull up the canons of the Council of Nicaea, and, and we'll, you'll see if, if that's true or not. By the way, if you hear them in the background, there's some kids playing in the street. There's not a murder going on. <laughs> I'm really glad that you that you made note of that. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming here. I'm a little afraid to check. <laughs> Oh, it'd be a first for the podcast. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it really is. Yeah, so time and place. I, I, yeah, I totally get that, right? But I, for the most part, it usually, for me at least, what was this kind of, yeah, this kind of claim is out there. I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought, once you once you make me say it's this time and place, well, then that becomes a little bit like, oh, yeah, well, I, I better look into this. Like, when mm-hmm. when was that? And, and when did that happen? And, and, and how? And I guess the, the next step, right, would be, okay, well, then let's look at the these practices these these catholic practices and see how far back they go how how what you know what time what time they suddenly change or or, or something right Cause if if the claim is that the catholic church came and somehow that corrupted this early ancient faith and we would be able to find this early ancient faith before before it's corrupted right and if we can find that then we can find the time and place if we if we can't find that what <laughs> What's the conclusion then? Yeah, it, I think this is really well said. You'll occasionally, I, I want to uh, anticipate a response that some Protestants have to this, which is, well, the reason we can't find any evidence of these early Protestants is because the evil Catholic Church destroyed all the evidence. Yeah. And to that, I would just say, I don't think you understand how like writing in antiquity works. Like we're constantly finding ancient texts that were just preserved in a cave somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you also have, you know, so... Until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, or no, I'm sorry, excuse me, the uh, discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt, uh, which was this treasure trove of Gnostic texts, the best source for Gnosticism was actually St. Irenaeus of Lyon's Against Heresies. That, in other words, Catholic opponents of a heresy spend a great deal of time spelling out what it is that their opponents believe. So if, you know, if tomorrow all the Protestants got raptured, you could still find from books like mine what Protestant theology resembled in some way. Even if we decided, well, let's go burn every Protestant book because, you know, we're this wicked, corrupt organization. You would still find from the response books people responding to Protestant claims. And so you'd be able to piece together what Protestantism must have taught from that. So if there are Protestants in the early church, it's really remarkable that they never left any writings and that their opponents never left any writings responding to them, and that no one seemed to have even heard of them. They just simply disappeared without a trace. That's not a good historical theory. To say, here's this uh, this church that Christ calls a, a city on the hill and a light that can't be hidden under a bushel basket, 
and it's invisible and it leaves no trace and it's you know the mustard seed that grows under the mustard tree but it actually just dies out instead uh, you know those it, it doesn't fit theologically it doesn't fit historically it makes no sense so i think if if that's the claim you're working with it doesn't work and so then you're left with uh, i think the full brunt of, of your question which is what do you do if you can't find any evidence of this church that your theology would entail exists but if just think about it. In the first century, we know we know from Acts, we know from the writings of St. Paul, we know from the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, there are faithful, devoted Christians up to the end of the first century who, by all appearances from the apostles speaking about and to them, get the gospel. Now, granted, not everybody does, but there's huge groups who do, who understand the gospel, who are willing to die for it, who are orthodox in their belief, and especially on issues like baptism. You know, St. Paul can speak of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, because these are really rudimentary doctrines that everybody gets. Now, the Protestant claim, and I'm speaking loosely, like Protestants who, who reject the specifically Catholic claims about baptism, the Eucharist, and the like, the Protestant claim is that this church remarkably quickly didn't get it right at all, that everyone went from understanding it to not understanding it. And again, there, there's no evidence of this transition. Like if everybody gets baptism and the Baptist teaching on baptism is true, you should find a lot of first century texts talking about baptism is just a symbol. For that matter, you should find some New Testament texts that talk about how baptism is just a symbol. But you don't. Instead, you get things like references to the washing of regeneration or baptism now saves you in 1 Peter 3.21, or John 3, where Jesus says you have to be born again of water and the spirit. And then it's followed by the apostles going to go baptize. Like all of those things point in one direction and not the direction of the Protestant case. It's not like you have to carefully balance the evidence here. It's that one side literally has no historical evidence from a time and place they should have a wealth of historical evidence. And the other side, the Catholic side, actually can point to a pretty good deal of, of evidence that even many Protestant scholars and historians are going to grant that the early church was Catholic. And I guess the interesting thing for me is you, you, you're into conspiracy theory territory, right? If you're, if you're trying to say, well, within, the, within very shortly with the church being, being born and, and beginning to spread, they believe this, but those documents are, are gone now. We don't have those. They're, they were erased there. We don't know. I mean, you can think of all kinds of ways to explain that away, but they all end up in some kind of weird conspiracy theory territory where you end up having to, you know, ex explain the roots of your faith by by some rather unsavory means, I, I, I think, right? Like, yeah. yeah, I think that's that's well put, that it, it really does boil down to, uh, if you can't, believe the early witnesses to the gospel on what basis are you even christian in other words like if you buy this conspiracy theory that there's a church in 300 or whenever that is so all-powerful that it can track down every protestant writing in the homes of everyone or you know you know whatever like a, a kind of reach in power that the church even at her height didn't have like the catholic church that couldn't stop the reformation yeah. With an actual army <laughs> back in 300, having just been freshly legalized, it was somehow able to, to round up every Protestant writing. And not only that, but prevent any knowledge of this crime ever, ever existing. So no historian knows this happened. Once you're in that territory, you're in sheerly in the territory of imagination. You might as well say, and they killed all the unicorns and burnt their bones. <laughs> like it you're just making up fables. You're, you're making up pure fiction. Uh, there's no evidence of it. And the reason you find people going to such absurd lengths is because they need this to be true for their historical and theological claims to make sense. Like there's a reason you find otherwise respectable Christians indulging in this kind of, pardon my bluntness, this kind of lunacy. Uh, and so the, the flip side of that, the, the second kind of point I'd make on that is, if you're going to go down that road, and then we're going to ask, well, how do you know the Bible wasn't also corrupted by this all-powerful church? The kind of mental gymnastics necessary to believe, well, because the Bible says it's going to be preserved. Oh, the Bible given to you by the church you just said is all-powerful and corrupt and editing documents and, you know, getting rid of all the evidence it doesn't like. It tells you, like, that it, you can see, hopefully, 
that doesn't work. Like the logical conclusion, like if you're going to go the conspiracy theory route, in spite of all the evidence, the logical place to end up is a rejection of Christianity, not an endorsement of like a watered down Christianity. It, it leaves you with nothing because on what basis do you trust that the Christians of the second century and on faithfully preserved the biblical text? Yeah, absolutely. And just one side point there, unicorns aren't, aren't real. Actually, there's a fascinating side point with this. Marco Polo, <laughs> in his writings, uh, recounts his surprise at discovering unicorns and them not being like he had read about in the fairy tales. <laughs> and it, what he almost certainly discovered was the rhinoceros. <laughs> not quite as majestic as the unicorn. <laughs> no, he, he mentions they're much uglier than he expected. <laughs> he, tried great... to, he tries to ride yeah. one and fly and he just, it just stands. <laughs> That's fantastic. So the the way to figure out if the if the church was was corrupted from the early church to the Catholic Church is, the, of course, a look at the, those early writings and so many yeah so many uh, you know I I had I had Marcus Gordai on the show uh, a couple of years ago and I asked him host of the Journey Home who's heard hundreds if not thousands of conversion stories from from people like like myself who found the Catholic Church and I asked him I said is there a pattern to those who convert? Are there, are there things that most converts encounter that, that pushes their conversion to becoming Catholic? And he said, yes. He says, authority and the early church. Now, Joe, you've written books on both of these things. So you're tapped into the zeitgeist of the convert quite quite clearly. I, uh, I talked to a lot of uh, Protestant okay. converts and, yeah, and yeah. I ask people about their stories and these things come up constantly. Yeah. I, I think Brody's absolutely right. And of course, he's talked to way more people about their conversion stories than I have. Yeah. Uh, some of my favorite stories have been watching his show. So, I mean, he's an expert on it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it really is quite remarkable. A friend of mine uh, just one day got curious and started asking, well, where does the Bible come from? And this is before I even knew her and just started researching the question and became a Catholic. Like yeah. those kind of questions are the ones that I hope Protestants and maybe Protestant listen, Protestants listening to this are asking, okay, I take scripture very seriously how do I know that the New Testament is reliable? How do I know the Gospels are the right Gospels? These four and no others. Uh, and you're going to come to one of two conclusions. Either you're going to say, we can trust these early Catholics. We can trust the early church. We can trust the Catholic church, in which case you're most of the way home. Or you're going to say something like, well, we can't. And so we just, we're, we're hoping this is the right set. And then you're left with like a fallible set of infallible books. And I think it was John MacArthur's saying. But, you know, if, if that's the case, you've undermined the authority of the Bible more than uh, liberal theologians uh, could ever hope to. Because what you've just said is the Bible is right and infallibly right in those places when it's infallibly right. And that's a, that's a nothing claim. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, my test answers are infallibly true. Uh, it's just I have a fallible set of them. I don't know which of them are the right infallibly true ones. Like that, that's meaningless. You might as well just say, I don't think the Bible's infallible because that's where you end up. Or I hope these books are infallible because I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, either way, you end up in this place that, that does, you know, it, it, look, the reformers, I, I give them credit for trying to uh, preserve the integrity of the Bible from what they saw as ecclesial threats. I, I think that they are largely motivated by good motives. Uh, I think human pride and all that stuff mixes in. I think errors in judgment mix in. But the result of their work isn't that the Bible is held in a stronger position. You get, you know, within Luther's own lifetime, him saying maybe these books don't belong in the Bible. You get Calvin saying a different set of books don't belong in the Bible. That's a problem that you don't end up with a stronger canon of Scripture. You don't end up with a stronger Bible. And I say the same thing to any Protestant who it rejects the evidence for where the Bible actually comes from, that you're not going to end up with a stronger Bible. You either end up halfway into the Catholic Church, maybe more than that, or you end up in a situation where, where you have gotten much more of a kind of a modern skeptical view of Scripture. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. That's well said, right? And I think the interesting thing is that more and more, when you begin looking into to modern biblical scholarship, I mean, the the premise that I was that I kind of grew up on as as evangelical was that we had the more accurate Bible as as, as, as non Catholics, right? Catholics added the books to the Bible, right? But once you begin to actually uh, dig into biblical studies and how the Bible is put together, and and even more recent discoveries about about you know, different books found in different places, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and these kinds of things. 
I think I think modern Bible studies would would argue that no, actually, the the, the Catholic canon is closer to the canon that that the the early church would have used. I mean, just based on history, I think. Yeah, right? if I understand that correctly. Yeah, so you have the actual endorsement of the Catholic canon in Toto and some of the fourth century councils, like the third council of Carthage, pretty famously. Before that, there you will find discrepancies in which books belong in the Bible, but every book in the, the so-called Deuterocanon, the seven books that Catholics accept as scripture and Protestants reject as apocrypha, every one of those seven books is quoted by the early Christians and quoted as scripture. So these are not books that were added in the medieval period, that by the time you have a set New Testament, uh, you have a Bible, New and Old Testament, that includes these books. That before that, you have people saying, well, maybe it should be this, maybe it should be that canon, and you don't have agreement. By the time agreement comes, it's agreement in the Catholic direction. Yeah, I think that that's that's well said. That's well said. Great, great points, Joe, of course. So if, if we're looking again at other other ways we can see that the church we know it wasn't this one thing encrypted by the Catholics into something else. We can look at areas. Uh, you you outline a bunch of different areas we can we can look at in your book and dig into things like like baptism and and the Eucharist and and the the hierarchy these kind of things. I we we could spend all day digging through this, but I want to kind of lay out what are a few ways you want to highlight to say look, here's where we can show that the early church was Catholic. It wasn't this and then corrupted. To, to, to become this. What, I guess, first of all, what, what sources do you begin to look at to, to show that this church, because you can dig in sources from, say, 600 AD and go, oh, look, this over here looks very Catholic, and someone will go, oh, well, that's, that's way too late. Obviously, they, they were corrupted. You've got some pretty early sources, though, I, I think, that you use to, to kind of argue uh, to, or to demonstrate some Catholic ideas the church had in her infancy, right? Yeah, so I'm using a, a kind of soft deadline of about the year 200. Uh, and so I'm looking at Christians writing in about the year 200 or earlier. Occasionally I'll pull in someone a little later and I'll, I'll kind of flag that when I do it. Uh, if I think they have something helpful for helping us understand, or if I think they just say something really beautifully, I, uh, I'll cheat a little. And But I, I acknowledge when I'm doing it. Um, but I, I'm trying to get just the Christians of the first 200 years of Christianity, and really less than the first 200 years, like really like 100 and, 150 to 170 years of Christianity, basically, from like 30 AD until 190, 200. That, uh, that period is not as long as it may sound. And the example I give in the book is that the Apostle John, who seemed to have been very young when the crucifixion happens, is said by early Christians who have died in about the year 100. We know like the reign of the emperor under under whom he died. Uh, and he leaves behind two students, uh, Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp of Smyrna. And Polycarp is born in the year 69. He dies in the year 155. He mentions his age at his trial when he's martyred. So we know exactly like, he dies at age 86. Uh, and his martyrdom is attested to within a year that there's an account of his martyrdom written down by people who loved him. Uh, so it's not like one of these later legends where 500 years later, the, there's this story about this guy, Polycarp. No, no, no. We have written records within a year. Uh, that's You don't have that for almost anyone in history. So he's actually a really remarkable bit of evidence we have for Polycarp. Well, Polycarp leaves behind a couple of students, the most famous of which is St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who I mentioned before. He's writing in 180. So 180 may sound like a really long time after, you know, Calvary. But it's 114 years after the death of Peter and Paul. And in the book, I, I use a <laughs> now moot example that Diedrich von Hildebrand was in college 114 years ago and his uh, second wife, Alice von Hildebrand, is still alive. Now, very shortly after I published my book, she, she passed away. <laughs> but it's still a, a real testament to the fact that 114 years sounds like this incredibly long time, but in the span of human lifetimes, it's much closer. Like if you wanted to know what happened 114 years ago, it wouldn't be that hard to find out from people who were in a position to know, not because they'd been there themselves, but because they'd grown up with people who'd been there themselves, who people who remembered those years well. Um, that's still the period of what uh, Marcus Bachniel calls living memory. That when Irenaeus is writing, he knows what Christianity is not because he read about it in a book or because he heard about it from, you know, just some random group of Christians. He knows because 
a guy who learned Christianity at the feet of an apostle taught it to him. That's living memory. And, and really, after about 200, that kind of stops. So in terms of like the scope of, of who I'm using, I'm looking at that time period. In terms of what I'm covering, I'm, I'm purposely looking at issues on which uh, you have the early Christians very much united and on issues of, of real importance. And in three of the four issues I look at, issues on which a number of Protestants are on the opposite side of the issue. Uh, I follow, of all people, a, a Reformed theologian, Michael Kruger, who suggests that we ought to look to the second century church uh, to see what they believed about doctrine, worship, behavior, and writings. So I look at, okay, well, I wonder what do they believe about the doctrine of baptism? How does one become a Christian? What does baptism do? All those questions. On worship, what was their worship like? You know, this is the spiritual heart of the guys we're talking about. Was their worship something that a Protestant could endorse? Or did they believe in the real presence and the sacrifice of the mass and these things that the reformers found anathema? And then on behavior, uh, looking specifically at this line, do nothing without the bishop. Like what was the role of the bishop in early Christianity? Is that some later medieval thing? Is that something that they slowly add on? Or is that there from the start? And then finally on writings, how do we know we got the right four gospels? So those are kind of the areas I'm looking at. And those are the reasons I'm looking at it. Partly because of Kruger, partly because they're, they're really united on this, this front, that it's, it's a lot easier to kind of present that case and say, well, 80% of them thought X and 20% thought Y. No, no, we're going to take the really basic issues and see that Protestants don't even agree with them on, on the basic issues everyone's in, in union on. Yeah, that's a fantastic framework, right? Because of, yeah. Of course, right. If 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 we don't agree on on these things, I mean that 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 I'm thinking the timeline again, Joe. And that timeline is is it's quite tight, right? Yeah. If you're going to argue that these things that look very Catholic, that I want to unpack in a second, a few more, of the, you know, in, in a bit more detail. If we're going to say that these things were were corrupted from what originally they they would have been, right? So say Jesus taught the apostles, the apostles, you know, John John taught Polycarp. Maybe Polycarp got it wrong when he passed it on, right? I mean, if if we're that's a really quick turnover for the church falling into into chaos, right? Not being rescued again until the Reformation. I mean, that's is <laughs> that's not even biblical to think that the church would collapse on itself that quickly. I don't exactly think like the that. the idea that the gates of hell won't overcome the church, but. But, it'll have the lifespan of like a carton of milk yeah. is a problem or should be a problem. Like Protestants should really grapple with how do I square? Now it's fine to say the church fathers are not individually infallible. It's fine to say you'll find heretics even in the second century church. All of those things are, are not controversial points, but you can't use a kind of Poe buddies nerfect to explain how like an entire church can go from believing the teachings of Jesus to believing Catholic teachings that, that according to your theology are not the teachings of Jesus. It's not, you, you just can't say, well, people make mistakes to explain why everyone makes the same mistake in the same way and is convinced this mistake was taught to them by the apostles. Like that just doesn't cut it. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah I think that's very well said, Joe. So on baptism, right? Mm -hmm. Baptism, you mentioned before a little, a little, little preview of this, but the, the church fathers uh, are, are pretty unanimous on what baptism is and does, right? In, in the first 200 years of, of, of writing that we have. And it's quite different than say, I would have been told the early church believed as, as evangelical, right? I, I, I grew up in my faith. Believing that the, the baptism was a symbol, right? We did it when we turned, you know, we did it when we were ready to really commit to Christ. So I, th I think I was in, in, high, in high school, say 16 or 17 or something. And I said, you know what? I want to commit to really following Christ. I'll be baptized. It's a symbol for the community, for myself. That, that's all that it is. That's all it's ever been. It's never been or done anything else, is what I believed in my very narrow view of, of Christian history. And we would have said, this is what the early church believed, if you were to, to press us. But of course, you begin to dig into that in the very first, that really, the pristine church before any corruption could have crept in, right? What does it look like back then? A, a symbol? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, no, it doesn't. So you, to complicate the picture slightly, you have these largely symbolic baptisms, meaning you have Jewish uh, ritual baths that, that were meant to signify your turning away from sin, called a mikvah. And you have John the Baptist doing something pretty similar seeming uh, where people turn away from sin and are ritually washed uh, 
but it doesn't bestow, you know, the Holy Spirit. It doesn't give the imparting of, you know, these theological virtues. It doesn't do any of the things that we believe baptism does. But then you have the early Christians saying from Scripture itself that their baptism does something different. So let me just give you Acts 19, and then we'll look at the patristic evidence in a second. So in Acts 19, while Paulus is at Corinth, Paul passes through the upper country and comes to Ephesus. There he finds some disciples and he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they say, no, we've never heard, we've never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul then says, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, the clear sense of the text is that Christian baptism is something more than a baptism of repentance, or else Paul's description of John's baptism just makes no sense. Like, if, if what he means is John's baptism does the same thing ours does, but we mention the Holy Spirit explicitly, then it's bizarre to distinguish it as his was a baptism of repentance, pointing towards this, this greater thing to come. And it's very curious that the coming of the Holy Spirit is, is linked with this event happening. Uh, that certainly looks like, as Paul is baptizing them and laying hands upon them, something is actually happening that isn't reducible to a symbol. Now, I'm sure you can find Protestants who find some way away from the, the obvious implication of the text, but let's just point out the, the second half of, of what you were kind of asking, which is the early Christians thought the same thing that a, a plain reading of Acts would tell you, namely that baptism does something more than a baptism of repentance, more than a symbol. And in the book, I, I quote Everett Ferguson. Now, he's a Protestant scholar who is looking at the first 500 years of baptismal history and theology and liturgy uh, in his book, Baptism in the Early Church. And what he says, and this is a very lengthy book, I quote page 854. And I only mention that to, to tell you, like, he shows his work. He, he traces, here's what everyone believed about baptism. I do a little bit of that in the book, but I'm focused on the first 200 years, and I don't want the book to be a behemoth. And so I can give you, here's the basic view. Here are some people saying very Catholic thing about baptism. If you want the exhaustive, you know, if you want to spend your summer just reading about baptism in the early church, by all means, feel free. <laughs> uh, and he says that although in developing the doctrine of baptism, different authors had their particular favorite descriptions, there is a remarkable agreement on the benefits received in baptism. And then uh, he also points out that these benefits are already present in the New Testament text. Two fundamental blessings are often repeated. The person baptized received forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The two fundamental doctrinal interpretations of baptism are sharing in the death and resurrection of Christ with the attendant benefits and responsibilities and regeneration, that means rebirth, from above with its related ideas. So already a fully fledged Catholic doctrine of baptism is found from the beginning. When, when we go back and read, what do people believe about baptism? It isn't that this idea slowly creeps in. He said for 500 years, if you look at the first 500 years of Christianity, everyone gets what baptism does and says very similar things about it. Which by the way, if Paul is speaking in Ephesians of baptism being a basic doctrine, makes sense. That we should expect people to have this remarkable unanimity, this a widely shared understanding of a basic doctrine like baptism. All of that squares neatly with the Catholic claim about baptism. I don't think you can square that coherently with a Baptist vision of how, you know, how were all of these texts written in such a way that would lead a person to believe regenerative baptism? And how did all of these Christians believe in regenerative baptism if it wasn't true? It seems like a remarkable failure of the apostles to teach Christianity if they couldn't get a basic doctrine expressed in a way that didn't lead 100% of people into heresy. Yeah, and again, you're bumping into that problem of, okay, so what we find in those first centuries, the evidence that supports the, the Catholic view, no evidence that supports a view that is merely symbolic. And if we're going to say the church was pristine, it was a certain way, was, was evangelical, and then corrupted and became Catholic, well, the evidence so far on baptism 
points to no it it was catholic from the beginning right the corruption of that actually was the evangelical teaching that that merely sees this as a symbol right not the other way around i think that's that's you gotta you gotta sit in that tension if you're if you're not a uh, not a catholic or not or not a christian denomination that believes in regenerative baptism which there are of course those denominations but you have to sit as evangelical as i would be in that tension and go okay so what do i do with this information if i can't find this in that pristine early church right yeah i think that's a good question and again i mentioned ignatius earlier i would just mention here that he's one of the earliest to point out that the reason jesus was baptized is to purify the waters of baptism yeah yeah uh that he's baptized not because he needs it he doesn't even need to symbolically repent of sins when he's baptized the holy spirit descends upon him and you see this incredible theophany. The, the father proclaims, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And from that point on, now we have a baptism that does something. That Jesus transforms what had previously been this symbolic baptism of John. Now, Ignatius is saying all that. And so, again, it's like, if, if he's getting this wrong, he's getting a, an interpretation of the gospel of John wrong. And he studied under John for mm-hmm. years. So how is it that you, random Protestant, understand the Gospel of John better than John's own students understood John? And that's just one guy. I mean, we can multiply that because, again, it's all over. It's everywhere. How did no one understand this properly? Or, you know, Luther, towards the end of his life, was plagued by the question, or rather, excuse me, Luther, towards the end of his life, describes how earlier in his life, when he was beginning the Reformation, he was plagued by the question, are you alone wise? And he thought it was a demonic temptation. I don't think the voice of humility is a demonic temptation. I, I think it, recognizing that maybe you can learn from someone else is actually prudence and humility speaking, and that he mistakenly shuts that voice out and concludes, yeah, I'm right. Everybody before me is wrong. And again, like uh, the question I want to really push to Protestants who are listening to this is, would you accept someone doing that today? I mean, would you accept that someone said, no one before me from the time of the apostles has ever understood this basic Christian doctrine, but let me explain it to you. Or would you say this person is full of themselves and <laughs> they're not reliable? They're, they've been led astray by their own arrogance. Because certainly scripture gives us a clear indication. Like scripture tells us that we need to contend, contend for the faith delivered once for all to the apostles and to watch out for people teaching new doctrines. And if someone's coming along and saying, here's a teaching that no one's ever gotten right before, there's a really clear indication they're a false teacher. Yeah, that gives me flashbacks, Joe, because honestly, that was one of those verses that I can picture sitting in church on a Sunday morning in my evangelical church, hearing that being being talked about uh, multiple times. Right? We were, we're constantly on guard for these false teachers and these new and novel doctrines. Meanwhile, we're sitting here in these new and novel doctrines, like you know, that 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 lack of self awareness is pr- pretty remarkable, but but really interesting. <laughs> yeah, maybe let me just start two Bible verses that related to this conversation. The first would be Second Timothy uh, chapter four, verse three, in which Saint Paul warns that the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own liking. And then the other would be Second John, chapter one, verse nine in which he warns that anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. So both of those are warning against a kind of theological progressivism that says, here's some new teaching, uh, and it may be convincing sounding, right? That's the whole point about the itching ears. You, we shouldn't be so quick to assume that applies to other people and not to us. We should have the humility to know, like, there are going to be teachings that I want to be true, that aren't something like eternal security is a great example of like people really want to believe they can know that they can't go to hell and they don't need to sweat it anymore. And it's a very comforting false teaching. Uh, you know, you don't have to, you know, strive mightily. You don't have to do any of these things that like St. Paul talks about, about working out your faith with your salvation with fear and trembling. Like though you don't have to do any of that because you can just sit back and trust that from all eternity, you were guaranteed a spot in heaven. And that it's over and done with. Your your ears twitch. You want teachers who say that because it's very likable. 
that's understandable, but like we've got the scriptural evidence that says watch out for that. Like that should be a big red flag. And then when you read the early Christians and they didn't believe that kind of stuff, it's like, okay, someone along the way introduced a more comfortable version of Christianity. We can actually say who, like we can actually trace the, the first teachers of this doctrine. That's a big red flag that this is not of God. That if you can trace an idea to its origin, and that origin isn't Jesus Christ and the apostles, we've just disproven it in terms of like Christian doctrine. Yeah, yeah. Well said, Joe. Let's talk uh, for a second. I really want to get the bishops really badly, but I don't want to miss the mass because it's so important too, obviously. Yeah. Let's touch on the mass for a minute because, again, of course, the idea of communion as a, a merely a symbol is what I would have have doubled down on as evangelical, right? Of course, it's just a symbol, right? We even and I get I get nuts these days, Joe, when I read different different accounts of the Last Supper in different versions of of uh, you know kids' Bibles or a kids' <laughs> Bible story, and. <laughs> Because it makes me bonkers when they literally, the authors literally change the words of Jesus to make him say, this is like my body. Because <laughs> gosh, golly, Joe, he does not say that right. in the text, which drives me crazy when we're, we're changing this for children, right? Making it more, you know, that, that's, a, that's a doctrinal change. That's a change that, that is prompted by a certain view of what, what Christ said. But at any rate, Again, it should be a red flag. If you're changing the words of Jesus to make him sound Protestant, he must not sound Protestant without alteration. Yeah, I could get worked up over that for, for a while, but that's what I would have believed, right? Is that communion, that Christ was saying, this is like my body. That is not, I discovered, and you let us know too, what, what the earliest Christians believed, right? What, what? Yeah, so we have very clear witnesses to the fact that they believe that the Eucharist is Jesus, that it is Jesus in his body and blood. And we get this in a lot of places. One place we get this is in St. Justin Martyr's description of the Mass, in which he he lays out what happens in the liturgy. And it, it's remarkably like what you would get if you walked into a Catholic church today. There's a couple very small differences in terms of the order of things, but the ingredients are the same. Um, like one difference is we, we have a clear Old Testament epistle and gospel reading now, where he describes them reading the memoirs of the apostles, which sounds like they're reading the gospel. They, we don't know if they read the Old Testament. We don't know what, what role the writings of St. Paul had. They clearly were focusing on the gospels, as we do today, you know, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is the center point of, of the liturgy in terms of liturgy of the word. But anyway, when Justin gets to the Eucharist, uh, he has a lengthy, beautiful description of the Thanksgiving, which again is from this Greek word for Eucharist. Uh, and then he says, for not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ, our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise, we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our body and flesh by transmutation are nourished is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. And then he goes on from that and, and points out the, this is my body, this is my blood kind of language. And he doesn't have to change the wording because he believes this is his body and this is his blood. But notice that principle of identity that is, that the Eucharist is Jesus in his body and blood. That's the early Christian teaching. But what's more it, we can see this teaching come up in a really interesting way in the, the fight against Gnosticism in a couple of places, including in Justin's writing. Uh, I, I want to stress here, there's another important detail that I, I haven't really highlighted, but it's worth saying, that we have been taught. When Justin says that, he's making it clear, he's, he's not saying, as a theologian, my best take of what Jesus meant when he said this is this. It's, no, no, no. This is what we believe as Christians, because this is what was handed down to us by the apostles. And he's saying this in 160 when he can say that. He is about as far from the death of John as we are from like the Beatles appearance on the Ed McMahon show. Like it's not that ancient of history. There's plenty of people who would still remember it. Like it's, it's just not that long ago. Uh, and so when he's saying this is what we've been taught, that, that's a really good indication he's speaking for the whole Christian community. Again, he's, he's writing to the Romans to explain Christianity, to defend Christianity, hence the name First Apology, it's a defense of Christianity. And so he's writing not just about his own idiosyncratic views, but second, he's making it clear these are views that they, the Christians have received from the apostles. That's what they've been taught. So with that said, how does this function in the fight against Gnosticism? In a couple of places. Uh, number one, uh, when St. Ignatius of Antioch, again, back in like 107, 
uh, is writing against probably the Gnostics are definitely what are called docetists. They're people who believe that the incarnation wasn't real, that Jesus only spiritually appeared to be bodily, but he was basically just like a ghost. It, so he's writing to the, the church in Smyrna, and he's warning them uh, not to have anything to do with those people. And uh, he very clearly says to abstain from them because they don't confess the Eucharist to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And he warns uh, that they incur damnation when they do that. This is a pretty big tell. Like already, he's not arguing, hey, church and smart, you should really start believing the Eucharist is Jesus. He's saying because the Docetists, these Gnostics or whatever they were, uh, don't believe that Jesus really has a body, then they can't believe that the Eucharist is really his body. Because they don't think he had, you know, they, they had no body on the cross, he has no body in the Eucharist, etc. Uh, a Protestant encountering this, I think it's fair to say, would say, hey, these guys are heretics because they deny the incarnation. These guys are heretics because they deny the cross. And he says all of that, and, and that, all of that's true. But his focal point in the letter is in chapter 7 when he talks about how they deny the Eucharist. And therefore, we can't be in communion with them because they don't believe in communion. Like, they, they don't believe in Eucharistic communion, we can't be in ecclesial communion. And that in so doing, they incur damnation. Now, he's already using belief in the real presence as a litmus test and treating it as a sin mortally to deny. That's really big. That's, again, 107. Then flash forward to Justin, who I already mentioned. Uh, he's talking about the Gnostics, and he says, then again, how can they say that the flesh, which is nourished with the blood of the Lord and with his, or excuse me, with the body of the Lord and with his blood, goes to corruption and does not partake of life? Let them, therefore, either alter their opinion or cease from offering the things just mentioned. But our opinion is in accordance with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist, in turn, establishes our opinion. So, a couple things there. First, he's clearly arguing for bodily resurrection based on a Eucharistic theology. He's using the Eucharist to prove this disputed point of bodily resurrection, which, ironically, we're in a situation now where Protestants believe in bodily resurrection, deny the Eucharist. Like, this argument couldn't work from a Protestant. It would be incoherent for a Protestant to offer something like this against the Gnostics. And so it points to what a radically different world Justin lives in, that he takes it for granted uh, that, okay, we all believe in the real presence. We all believe that the Eucharistic offering is truly the sacrifice of Christ. Therefore, anyone who believes something that's incompatible with that must be wrong. <laughs> so I think all of that is just enormous. Now, if I may, I know it's kind of a long answer, but I, I want to maybe add one thing, that uh, the offering part is really important because it's sacrificial language, that the Mass isn't just Jesus is bodily present, but the Mass is actually the sacrifice of Jesus, that we are consuming the food sacrifice offered to God on Calvary. And the food sacrifice is his flesh given for the life of the world, that all of that would make total sense to someone coming from a Jewish or a pagan background, because Jews and pagans alike had food offerings. You know, you slay the Passover lamb and then you eat it. Jesus is the new Passover lamb, so it makes sense that we eat his flesh. Uh, from a medieval perspective, or a perspective like the reformers, this looks like re-sacrificing Christ, because it's the idea of like the meal completing the sacrifice rather than re-sacrificing has now been kind of distorted in the minds of a lot of people. So even a lot of people today are like, well, isn't the sacrifice of the mass re-sacrificing Christ? And the answer is no, it's completing the sacrifice. But the, the point here is that this notion of the sacrifice of the mass really is universal. And it's not just me who says that. And it's not just like a handful of scholars. Like Martin Luther argued that there is no belief in the church more generally received or more firmly held than that the mass is a good work and a sacrifice. And Calvin said that Satan had somehow not only obscured and perverted, but altogether obliterated and abolished the Lord's Supper by blinding almost the whole world into the belief that the mass is a sacrifice and oblation for obtaining the remission of sins. But you don't find a more foundational, more universally agreed upon belief than this. And the reformers knew that while rejecting it. That's how radical the Reformation is. Like, this is not... Oh, you read it this way, I read it that way, but like people have always disagreed. No, no, no. It's like everyone always knew it meant this, and I think it means that. And then Luther actually says it's universally believed, and, and not only says it, gives reasons why it's universally believed. He says the canon of the Mass itself, 
regularly uses his sacrificial language. It says these gifts, these offerings, these holy sacrifices, this oblation. There's a distinct prayer in which it asks that the sacrifice be accepted like the sacrifice of Abel. Christ is called the victim of the father, excuse me, the victim of the altar. The church fathers agree on this. A great number of authorities agree on this in the usage that has been constantly observed throughout the world. That's what he said. It's not just like the Western church believes this. The West and the East, the Oriental church, all everyone agrees on this. Everyone's always believed this. And Luther's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe it. That's really <laughs> the stakes that we're looking at here. This is, again, not an issue in which there's like a 60-40 split within Christianity. This was universally what Christianity taught until someone just came along and said, maybe not. Yeah, that's remarkable. And you can find, of course, you can find writings where people may sound like they are disagreeing with the idea of sacrifice of the mass or the real presence. But what we find, if we're, if we're, if we're working with a thesis that the early church was somehow corrupted, I don't think you can find those for quite a while. But everybody else, everybody seems to be speaking you know, Just, Justin and, and Irenaeus are, are speaking quite literally in those earliest writings. So if we're saying that, no, 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 it, it was default one way and it, it changed. Well, first of all, L Luther and Calvin aren't saying that, right, right. Where, they, where, where they could. But say if, if Joe even Jocelyn in the street is saying that, we just don't have the evidence in, in the earliest church that that was, that was being, being debated or, or believed or, or, or discussed, right? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the kind of thing. There's sometimes this attempt to um, make Luther more in continuity with history than Luther thought he was, or to make Protestants more uh, continuous with the Catholicity of the church than they believed they were. They, they knew they were rejecting this. They knew no one before us thought these things, but we think they're right because we're these very enlightened 16th century thinkers. And it's just a dangerous road to go down. In the same way that if someone did the same thing now as an enlightened 21st century thinker, we'd click quickly spot the kind of hubris and the arrogance of this. I mean, this is not long before you get a group of people calling themselves the Enlightenment and declaring everyone before them as having lived in the Dark Ages. There's a little bit of a narcissism going on. It's in the air. It's in the water. Because you have the, the amazing explosion of the Renaissance not long before this. They, you, you do have this incredible explosion of knowledge. And so people get a little puffed up on their own uh, wisdom and brilliance and knowledge and think they know more about history than they do and think they know more about theology than they do. Like it's important that the closer someone is to the time when animal sacrifice was widespread in paganism and in Judaism, the more they seem to get what's going on in the sacrifice of the mass because they have a framework to understand it. And so even a Catholic today has to kind of work through what we mean by the bloody and the unbloody dimensions of the sacrifice because it's just a totally foreign thing. You don't see people sacrificing animals regularly. I mean, unless you live like really close to like some Santeria cult, you don't regularly engage with like animal sacrificers. And, and so it's just an important thing. Like it's, I honestly understand why the reformers are confused and scandalized by this sacrificial theology because they don't have a framework to understand it. In. The earliest Christians did, and they have a much better theology of sacrifice. Yeah, <laughs> very well said. I don't know a lot of animal sacrificers either around, around here in Canada, so so it's it's hard to, the context. Yeah, it's challenging. I do want to touch for a minute on the bishop because this for me was, I mean, this is the thing out of all the things that I encountered when I began reading the early church fathers. I think I got the, I got an ebook of the Antonine Fathers for like three dollars off of Amazon, and, and I was blown away by like the the eighteen hundred pages or so of of like these, you know, I. I totally scandalized by how much writing there was from the early church. And I began to read and I encountered this idea. And actually, the funny thing is, I had Dr. John Bergsma on this show a number of times now, but once to tell his conversion story. And he mentions the same line that he read that for him just stopped him in his track. Because it was the same the same line for me that then you echo back to us in this book, the idea that, of doing nothing without the bishop. And of course, my idea of the early church before it became corrupted and politicized and before bishops were installed and cardinals and, and all this structure and hierarchy was this kind of church, this, this disparate church spread out across, across the, the Middle East, you know, little, little home church kind of cells of Christians with no structure and no organization whatsoever that the apostles just kind of started and, and left to flower. And then I encountered this in the earliest church Christian writings, this idea of, of the bishop. And I went, what? What is a bishop? What? That sounds really Catholic. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, I often very eye-opening because you'll find a lot. I mean, you'll even find scholars, both Protestant scholars, but Catholic scholars and, and secular scholars who claim some variation. Of, oh, originally it was very disorganized and then the structure came later. And they're taking essentially an evolutionary view that it evolved from a simpler thing into a more complex thing. But they're really imposing that on the evidence. The evidence doesn't say that. They're really, so any kind of emergent view, this idea that it was originally disorganized, the organization came later, requires believing three things. Number one, that the early Christians felt free to change the structure of the churches bequeathed to them by the apostles. That whatever the apostles gave to them, they felt okay changing that. Number two, that therefore there were various types of church governance in the early church. Some would have changed it this way, some would have changed it that way. And number three, that for pragmatic reasons or some reason, every local church eventually decided on this three-tiered system of government. You could bishop, priests, or presbyters, deacons. Uh, this is in technical terms called the monoepiscopacy, that there's one bishop per church. And none of those three things are true. Not like, in fact, the evidence argues against them. So first, the idea that the early Christians felt free to change the structure, they clearly didn't. First Clement in 96 talks about how like this is something that we've received and are meant to carry on. Second, the idea that there's uh, various types of church governance is just not true. The only evidence we ever see of any clear structure is of the three-tiered structure. We don't see anything of like a clearly disorganized church. You know, we can give you the names of who the bishops were in many of these early cities. And we're not from like local legend. We mean like from Ignatius writing to Polycarp or mentioning the bishop by name and mentioning who the presbyters are and mentioning who the deacons are. Like we can tell exactly who was in the church and who was in these positions of authority. The people claiming oh, originally it was presbyteral or congregational and then it like evolved. It's a fantasy. You can just say, okay, great. Who were those co-ruling leaders? What were their names? Tell me about them. When did they rule? Like, how did that get started? Because every church founded by the apostles kept written, written records. Uh, Tertullian mentions this in 200. Irenaeus alludes to it in 180, that all of the churches founded by the apostles kept records of who all their bishops were from the time of the apostles onwards. So unless everyone throughout the church is just lying and inventing evidence, that there's just no evidence of this. And in fact, a great deal of evidence against it. There's documentary evidence that there were bishops from the start. Now, Leon Morris in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology puts it this way. He says, nowhere is there evidence of a violent struggle, as would be natural if a divinely ordained congregationalism or Presbyterianism were overthrown. The same threefold ministry is seen as universal throughout the early church as soon as there is sufficient evidence to show us the nature of the ministry. And it's clear, even from the writings of Clement, that this is not for pragmatic reasons. This is because they view it as an inheritance from Judaism bequeathed to them by Jesus and the apostles. In Judaism, you have the high priest, the priests, and the Levites. In the New Testament, you have the bishop, the presbyters, later called priests, and the deacons. And they, just as Israel wasn't free to just dispense with the high priest if they wanted to, or dispense with the Levites if they got inconvenient, so two Christians weren't free to just throw off this kind of leadership structure. And when the Christians in particular areas did rebel, you've got people like Clement writing to them, telling them to obey their leaders. You've got people like the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews telling them to obey their leader. You know, so it's very clear. You've got people like Ignatius of Antioch repeatedly saying to obey your leaders and saying very significantly that without that three-tiered structure of bishop, priest, deacon, you have no church that it, the early Christian understanding was not church means wherever like two or three are gathered or just anyone who believes in their heart, Jesus is Lord. No, no, no. Church has a concrete meaning and it's structural. So when people say, oh, it doesn't, you know, the example you gave earlier of your former pastor, it doesn't mean Catholic church in that sense. Ignatius would say, yes, it does. You know, like very clearly, here's what it means. So there's a lot more that could be said about that. But in terms of just teeing up the general issue, I'd say it's right there and it's right there from remarkably early on, whereas it's just an utter absence of evidence in the other direction. Yeah. And of course, the big question for that, right, is, okay, so if this is the uncorrupted earliest church in, in its infancy that then became corrupted at some point, when, when, but they had bishops back here, and it's quite clear, and I don't have a bishop now in my evangelical church, we don't even have any kind of, we don't have, what, what? 
what do I do with this? And for me, that was a huge shocker because I thought we don't even have in our language the idea of a bishop. We we have maybe some elders in our church that we that we elect democratically and they're they're accountable to a senior pastor who's appointed by the elders, uh, or you know the denomination that oversees this or some kind of structure. And they, and they they vary from denomination to denomination, from church to church. And non-denominational churches have even less of a structure than that because there's no denomination they're they're accountable to. We had nothing to do with with like a a bishop, and I read this and I went, well, where's my bishop? Like if the earliest church mm-hmm. believed that the church is where the bishop was, we shouldn't do anything without the bishop. When did that stop being believed, right? And and I think Joe, in all of this, you begin to see that this. Well, first of all, like you, the title of your book suggests, the early church was was Catholic, and that that corrupted church. It wasn't. It wasn't the Catholic Church that corrupted some original church that was there before. I, I, I would have had to admit that as an evangelical, I was in the corrupted church. Mm-hmm. I was in the church that had changed things that, from infancy, Christians believed, yeah. and and that's a ton of bricks. Like that's a yeah. A no, big thing. A, I really like that way of putting it. Like if the claim is the problem with Catholics is they believed something the early Christians didn't. And then you say, okay, cool, if you're against that, and everybody in the other church believes in bishops, and you think bishops are expendable or unnecessary or even false, you're literally doing the thing that you've accused Catholics of doing. You're literally doing the thing that you think invalidates Catholicity. How would that not invalidate your own position? I think that's a, I think that's a great question. I think the, the question any well-meaning Protestant should ask themselves when they kind of encounter this evidence. Yeah, I, I think so. Okay, the last thing I want to ask you is, to wrap this up, is is... The idea, because I think this is the other comment that can maybe uh, escape you from asking these questions to begin with. And this was put to me by somebody that I was, my wife and I, as I was converting, we went to see a, a family therapist, to, honestly, Joe, to work through the experience of me converting from this faith that we had shared for our whole entire marriage. And and it, it, it was uh, maybe a poor choice in, in, in therapist because it wasn't necessarily friendly to, to Catholics and, and grilled me. A little bit more than more than I would have been willing to pay for if I had known in advance what we were getting, <laughs> we were getting into. But one of the things that 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 he put to me, he said, "Okay, so you like this church? You've read the Church Fathers, like on and on." But he said, "Why is older better? Like, why does it matter that that you are trying to get closer to this older version of Christianity? Why is why is that important?" And I think this is. I don't think it's a good. I don't think it's a very good question. Now that I've thought about it for for almost a decade, I don't think it's a very good question to begin with. But it is a question that I think somebody could use to escape asking these questions altogether. I think it is a, a question you could use. I think once you begin to peel back that onion, it's not that great. But what do you think about that kind of that that idea? The, the, yeah. Why is why is older Joe? Why do I why do I even care what the earliest Christians believe? Why is that? a better version of Christianity. So there are a lot of things I could say in response to this, but one of them, just to keep it simple, I would say these are people who are in a position to know what the apostles taught. And so we, we basically have a trilemma. Either they're lying to us or they were themselves deceived somehow. You know, the Polycarp was lying about what John told them. And so he tricks Irenaeus. Or they're telling us the truth, and this, like, what they believe in the second century really is apostolic Christianity. Now, again, like, we can account for, like, people making little mistakes. In the same way that you can believe an eyewitness and still think an eyewitness is getting some details wrong. Eyewitnesses do that regularly. But if you think everyone is wrong about the major issues, that's a really different thing than, like, this this eyewitness, although reliable, still gets a few details wrong. Uh, That's what we're left with. And if you think that's Basically, if you go with that they're liars or that they're they're deceived, you're not left with Christianity. Because how do I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the books that belong in the Bible? It's ultimately because these people tell me, well, those are the ones written by the apostles, and the other ones are fake. I don't have some external means of verifying that. I have to trust that they're reliable. And if I don't trust that, I'm not left – again, I'm not left with anything. So that would be kind of the argument I would make, that – if you're going to reject the Christians of the second century, you're not left with Protestantism. You're just left with nothing. Uh, you're just not left with Christianity at all. If you're going to believe the Christians of the second century, you're not left with Protestantism either. You're left with Catholicism. And and so just to maybe put some meat on the bones there. When we're t- we were just talking about bishops, 
And one of the churches St. Ignatius of Antioch writes to is the Church of Ephesus. Now, of course, there's a Church of Ephesus in Scripture. This is the same church. It's a community of believers who had been founded by Paul, cultivated by Paul, who taught them a lot about the doctrine of the church. If you read the letter to the Ephesians, it has a lot to say about the church and the structure of the church and, and like the nature of the church and its relationship to Christ. He even says that uh, the total Christ is Jesus the head and the church's body. Like it's a really radical endorsement of like a high ecclesiology in a way that I, I think a lot of Protestants are frankly a little uncomfortable with. When Ignatius is writing them, not that long later, around 107, he greets their bishop by name and their bishop is Onesimus. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because there's an Onesimus in scripture, the escaped slave in the letter to Philemon. Now, Protestant scholars like F.F. F. Bruce have pointed out this is probably the same guy. And the reason it's probably the same guy is it explains a mystery, which is how we got Philemon in the Bible. You know, the other letters, St. Paul's circulars, where he writes to a church and then they pass it around, we get why those are there. You know, he writes to the Romans, they're going to keep and preserve the letter and copy it. The letter to Philemon is kind of an embarrassing letter. It's A, extremely personal, and B, uh, rebuking a slave owner for mistreating his slave, basically. <laughs> and so how did that letter get there? Well, if Philemon goes on to become the bishop of Ephesus, which was an important center in compiling the New Testament text, problem solved. It makes sense why he would know about that letter, why he might find that important. He would know it was authentically Pauline, but you wouldn't know otherwise. Uh, and so all of that means, now I think granted, that's, that part's a little speculative. Someone could reject the last two minutes of what I'm saying and not really hurt the Catholic case. But if it's true, if F.F. F. Bruce and these others are right, well, great. Then we know that one of these sole bishops of an apostolic church was one of the people praised in scripture by name. That's a problem if you think that he's a heretic or in error for being the sole bishop of Ephesus. Like it starts, you've now called into question this praiseworthy church. You've now called into question this praiseworthy saint. And, and the problems multiply from there. You can do the same all over the place. The, the church is praised in Revelation. We later hear many of them written to by Ignatius, and they clearly have this same one bishop per city structure. You know, again, it's all over the place. So you end up having to throw out a fair number of the cast of characters in the New Testament is unreliable in order to support the Protestant case on these issues. Yeah, and it, it, it gets more and more complicated, I think, to begin to, to do those kinds of things, I think, uh, becomes the case, <laughs> I'd argue. Uh, Joe, it's been a blast, uh, as it always tends to be, and time flies by when I'm talking with you. Um, so thank you. I think that's a great place to, to press, press pause and put a pin in this conversation and, and entice readers to dig into more things you have to say. And you have a lot to say because you're, you're very busy. You're constantly popping up in my news feeds with new, I don't know where, where you find time to write all these articles on top of your books <laughs> and your speaking in, engagements. Uh, where do you want to point people towards to find out more to, to follow you and that kind of thing, Joe? Yeah. I, I'll, I mean, I've got my own blog, Shameless Popery. Uh, shamelesspopery.com. Uh, but a lot of stuff I'm doing right now is over at Catholic.com for Catholic Answers because that's where I work. And uh, I really enjoy doing all that stuff. If you want this book, uh, you can get it a lot of places. You can get it at your local Catholic bookstore or on Amazon. But I'd really recommend the Catholic Answers store. Uh, I think you'll get the best rate. We're doing a bulk thing now. Like if you've got a Bible study or you know book study or uh, if you want to get it for your parish, if you want to get like 20 books, I think we're giving them away for like $3 a book right now. And I don't think you're going to get a better deal than that. So if you want to save a lot of money, I'm cool with it. Just go get it the lowest price you can find. I'm more interested in you reading it than me getting an extra dollar or two off of the sale. So, uh, you know, please, by all means, I'd say check it out, pray about it, and, and see where the Lord leads you. That's fantastic. And I'll put links as well to your past appearances on this show because Pope Peter also is, gosh, I think the best book that you can find right now on Defending the Papacy, Joe. It's just fantastic. Oh, it's, just, it's it's dense and packed with everything you can possibly want and imagine to defend the papacy. So so kudos on, on that one as well. And uh, I'll put links to those things uh, in the show notes, Joe. And I want to say thank you. I want to say God bless the work that you are doing uh, Catholic Answers and your blog in, 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 in sharing this stuff with the church and with us, helping to equip us to explain and defend the faith and, uh, and to, to make us think. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about those listeners who are, who are hearing our voices and 
gosh, it's a lot to think about if you're if you're trying to be authentically Christian as the early Christians were. <laughs> well, good. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. And, you know, uh, count on my prayers if, if you're a person listening to this on that journey. Uh, thanks, Joe. Take care. Yeah, thanks.